Thus it came to pass in that time that the Numenorians first made great settlements upon the west shores of the ancient lands, for their own land seemed to them shrunken, and they had no rest or content therein, and they desired now wealth and dominion in Middle-earth, since the west was denied. Great harbors and strong towers they made, and there many of them took up their abode, but they appeared now rather as lords and masters and gatherers of tribute than as helpers and teachers. Hey everyone, Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today we will be looking at each of the settlements, towns, cities, harbors, etc. that belonged to Numenor in the Second Age. Hopefully this video and others to come on Numenor will help to make the lore about Westerness a bit more approachable, as it is quite scattered throughout the Legendarium. For my history on Numenor and other related articles and videos, please check out the links in the cards and descriptions. My friends, thank you all so much for watching. Let's begin our tale. We will start with the settlements on the island itself, and we shall begin with Armenolos the Golden, the city of kings, which was the capital. Now, Numenor was split into different districts based on the geographical locations of the five-pointed star that was the shape of the island. There was Forostar to the north, Orostar to the east, Hyarostar to the southeast, Hyarnustar to the southwest, Endustar to the west, Metalmar, which was the central region, Armenolos the capital, was just east of the central mountain Meneltarma, in the eastern part of the Metalmar region, known as Arondor, the King's Land. Situated on a hill, the city would likely be the first settlement created on the island after the Numenorians landed on the eastern part of the island, which would become Romena in 32 of the Second Age. This city would be very symbolic of Numenor at large, and it's changed throughout the history of the Second Age for it had a road leading through the city from the haven of Romena to that of Andunia, connecting east to west, both in geography and theme. The great house of kings sat in the city, which may have been built with the help of Maiar. There too were the courts of the king and the white tree Nimloth, after the elves gave the seedling of this tree to their friends and men. Elros would be crowned here and would begin the line of the Numenorean kings. Near the city of Armenolos was the valley of Norianon, which contained the tombs of the kings of Numenor cut into the rock of Mount Meneltarma. Again, this city would be symbolic of Numenor at large, for while this may have been the greatest city of men in Arda, it would, by the late part of the age, become the greatest seat of vanity and evil in Numenor, as the king's men of corrupted Numenor would erect a temple to Morgoth here at the behest of Sauron, the king, Arpharazon's advisor. The white tree Nimloth and human beings alike would be burned on the altar of this temple. This city in the end, with all the others in Numenor, would be ruined in the downfall of Numenor in 3319. Next, let's look at Romena, which was also in Arondor, eastern Numenor. This haven would become the greatest seaport in Numenor, having been originally the place where Elros and the first Dunedain landed in Numenor. Throughout the history of this port, some of the greatest ships the world of Middle-earth would ever know, as well as the most renowned mariners of the kingdom, could be found there. Viantur, the captain of Tar Elendil's ships, had a home there with his own key, and Alderion, during his time as a sailing prince, could often be found there, coming or going from Numenor. In the Bay of Romena was the Isle of Tol Uinen, and upon this isle, Alderion built the Tower of Kalminden for it was here that the guild of venturers often birthed their ship, Ambar. While Eldarion's addiction to sailing the sea would cause problems in his story, and Romena would be subsequently closed for a time because of it, the port gained its own level of infamy when one of the later corrupt kings, Argimilzur, forced many of the faithful Numenorians to relocate to Romena from their home of Andunie, persecuting them. From this port, many of these faithful would leave to Middle-earth, and even as Romena fell in the downfall, Elendil and his sons barely escaped and led their men from this port towards Middle-earth. Speaking of Andunie, let's look at this city port next. Located on the western side of Numenor, in the Andustar region, the city would span from the edge of the western sea to the hills and mountains further east. This would originally be the largest city of Numenor, for in the early days of Westerness, a common name for the island, when the people still held close friendship with the elves, remembering the Elder Days, many folk lived here, in the city where the elves from Tol Erisea would visit them. Surely then, this was also one of the earliest built settlements in Numenor, 
as the fourth king Tar Elendil created the position Lord of Andunier and anointed his grandson Valandiel the first to hold the title. This would be an offshooting branch of the line of the kings of Numenor, which would eventually lead to the line of Elendil and his sons. But during the Second Age, this would remain an elf haven, and just as we see throughout the Legendarium, those who are elf friends among men are usually wiser than those who are not. So while wisdom remained in the descendants of the first Lord of Andunier and their people, Andunier itself would diminish over time, while Armenelos became greater. Eventually, elves would be banned from visiting, and the seat of the elf friends, now named the Faithful, became a place of persecution by the king's men of the east, and eventually the peoples of Andunier would be forcefully removed to Romena. Andunier would fall in the end of Numenor, but many of its legacies, perhaps more than those of any other settlement in Numenor, lived on with those who survived the downfall. Before we go to the settlements of Numenor and Middle-earth, let's quickly look at some of the less important and smaller settlements in Numenor. Little to nothing is known of it, but near Andunier is another smaller port, almost certainly named Almeida. On the hill of Oromet, the King Tar Minister built a tower to where he could gaze westward, and the later King Tar Palantir would also try to see Tol Arasea from this tower. Along the river Cyril was Nindamos, a large fishing village, and the largest of many small villages in the southwestern and southeastern lands. According to the Unfinished Tales, this was in the land of Hyarnustar. The city of Ondosto in Forostar in the north was along the western road leading from Romena to Andunie, and it may have been related to the stone quarries of the north. Also in Forostar was the Sarantil Tower, built by Tar Menelder, the fifth king of Numnor, who liked to gaze at the stars. Next in Andustar, in the Bay of Eldana in the west, was El Delande the Green, the most beautiful of the ports of Numenor, for it was in the subregion known as Nisi Meldar, where the fragrant trees and malorn trees grew. Elves and their swan ships from Tol Arasea came here most often in the earlier days of the Second Age. Finally, I should give some honorable mentions to the farm of Arendis in the countryside of Emerie, a subregion of Metalmar in the center of the island, and a shout out to the unknown Druidine homes who likely lived in at least one of the forests of the island, even if they were not technically Numenorean. Now let's take a look at the settlements of Numenor in Middle-earth. Of course, the kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor and all of their settlements and strongholds were technically settlements of Numenor, but I find those to be outside the scope of this video. I have a settlement of Gondor video and plan to make one for Arnor in due time. No, let's discuss the ports and cities of Numenoreans created during their forays into Middle-earth before the downfall. Vinyalande, or later called Lond Dyer, was seemingly the first port of the Numenorians after they returned to Middle-earth during the early Second Age with their great ships, built by Alderion and his men between 750 and 800 of the Second Age. This port would be founded on the estuary of the Gwathlo River by Prince Alderion the Mariner. Eventually, further up the river at Afford, the city of Tharbad would be founded. All around Tharbad and this port of the river were forests, which had been devastated by the Numenorians' need for timber to build their ships. The river was deepened, allowing for ships to come and go further up river near Tharbad. Eventually, during the War of the Elves and Sauron, Sauron would be caught near Tharbad and defeated, and he narrowly escaped back to Mordor. Tharbad would become even more important in the years of Arnor and Gondor, for the Great North-South Road would even come through this city and over its bridge. Looking further south, near where the river Anduin met the Great Sea, but a few miles inland, the city of Pelargir would be built in 2350, as a haven of the faithful Numenorians. After the downfall of Numenor, apparently the seas retreated further back, leaving Pelargir even further inland. But this would be the first city and main port of the Kingdom of Gondor, for Sildor and Anarian's ships came this way, passing it as they came up the Anduin. Finally, much further south was Umbar, which was made into a great fortress in 2280. While Pelargir would be the port of the faithful, Umbar would be the port of the king's men. And indeed, during some of Numenor's later expansion into Middle-earth, many of the Numenorians began to dominate, taking resources and people as slaves as they would, and likely Umbar was a major settlement for such evil deeds. In 3261, Arpharazon and his men would land here, taking Sauron hostage from Middle-earth soon after. After the downfall of Numenor, Umbar would survive as the refuge of the king's men, those who would go on to become the Black Numenorians and Umbar would be a threat to Gondor in the north for an entire age afterwards. 
But with that, we have covered all of the major settlements of Numenor. Indeed, there are many of them, so let me know if I missed any in the comments, and if so, I'll make a comment of my own to add lore about those as well. And so we come to the end of our tale on the settlements of Numenor. From this tale we see how ambition can at times be virtuous and ill-wrought at others. Ambition in the pursuit of peace and friendship in places like Andunie with the elves may create wonderful places to live in, but ambition in places such as Umbar in the name of dominion and conquest may just create further evil. Thank you all so much for watching, I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. What do you all think about these settlements? Let me know in the comments below. It's interesting to explore how widespread the influence of Numenor became throughout the Second Age. And this lore gets me excited to make more Numenorian content, especially as we get closer to the Rings of Power show. Thanks to our Valar tier patrons, Edwin de la Tour, Chris Ortner, Kyle Wetzel, Peter Shepard, Jonathan Putin, and Mark Kralik, Blair Scout, Merton, John Hume, Sam McBee, Matt Sabach, Elizabeth Calvert, Maz Gibbs, Ben Gardner, Condar, Race Jenkins, Anna Petrolik, Kuzan, Brandon Glidden, Molly Sullivan, Daniel Burns, and Anthony Harmon, our newest Valar tier patron. Thank you so much, and thanks to all of our patrons and YouTube members. Please subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the free peoples today. And I'll see you all again next week with an epic character history on Peregrine Took, Thane of the Shire. My friends, you all are the best. Thank you so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one.